Welcome to Ponch Church today. Praise the Lord. All right. Can anybody think of something wrong? Something that maybe isn't the way you want it? Uh, anybody come up with, you know, think of, you don't have to say what it is, but can you think of anything that maybe in the world is wrong or another human being or a, or a situation, maybe in our own body, just something that may be wrong? And if you think about it for a while, uh, you can kind of get overwhelmed. So I just kind of picked one. You know, uh, it just seems like the world, uh, we don't have to, like the, uh, my f p poster up there says, paint it black. It seems like it's already a pretty dark place, right? The world is already a pretty dark place. And so I'm just going to pick one that to kind of represent all the things in the world here and what's wrong and the darkness that's here. Uh, did you know that, I didn't know this, actually I had forgot about it, it's in our, our book, The Main Thing, and we were going over it at the prison on Tuesday, and uh, uh, I saw it again, and I hadn't thought of it in a long time, but did you, did you know that, and this was five years ago, I, uh, we put this in the book, did you know that five million people die every month on this earth? Doesn't that sound like a lot of people, five million Every month. Now, as a pastor, see, I've been concerned about this for a long time. So, you know, whatever, almost two years ago now, not quite, but almost two years ago, everybody got concerned with death. And I'm like, hey, I've been concerned about it for a long time. Five million people die every month. Every month. I actually think it's a, a bit of wisdom to get concerned about it. <laughs> It's been happening, you know, and I, I know what's the last couple of years. Bec and I just read the other day that a total of about five million people have died of this new virus. But before the virus, there was five million people dying every month. They're still dying every month. Now, as a minister, that really that really can affect me because I know just from statistics, two thirds of them don't even believe in Jesus. In the earth, five million people two th a, a month dying, going to meet Jesus, and they don't even, two-thirds of them don't even believe in him. And let's just say there's a third that believe in him, and I'm concerned about those guys too because I'm thinking, how many of, the, how many of those who profess to believe in Jesus actually keep his commandment? So th this might be a real small number, I don't know, but it may be. <laughs> so that, that's concerned me for a long time. For 20 years I've been concerned about that. Five million people are going to meet Jesus. They're going to they're, uh, face eternity every single month. And I don't know if they're ready. That, that really, you know, that can really weigh on you. And as a minister, you, you have to just cast that over to God. But, but that can really weigh on you. That, that's, a, that's this dark world we live in. That's pretty dark. Would you agree with me? That's pretty dark. And just add all the other stuff on top of that. But that's a pretty big one. Five million every single month. You know. So there's a lot of darkness. We don't have to make it any darker than it is. It's very, very dark. And that's just the stuff we know about. Evil has a way of doing a lot of things hidden that nobody even sees or knows. And, and so the evil here is even worse than we think it is. It's worse. This world is worse. Yet, everybody say yet. Now we'll get into the sermon part. I, I had to paint it black first. But the Bible says, in spite of all that, the Bible says, listen, you need to practice this this morning. The Bible says to celebrate and rejoice. That's actually what the Bible teaches. What do you mean? The world's a dark place. That's exactly what I mean. Did you know the scripture teach that we are to be different than the world and that we are to celebrate and rejoice in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation in this darkness? We're supposed to be different. We literally are supposed to be different. I don't know about you, but Jesus was different than everybody that walked before him or since. And we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be like him. 
So the believer then, if you, if you, if I say we believe in Jesus, the believer is to celebrate and rejoice, and it's not optional. As a matter of fact, I believe that it's crucial, that it's how we, this is how we were designed to get through this mess here. Celebrate and rejoice. That's how we're... That's, that's what we are to do because it is so dark here. Not be consumed with how dark it is. How many know, what kind of world would we live in? You've seen how crazy it's been for the last year and a half, almost two years. How many know if every night, every uh, news, every Facebook or post, every person talked about five million people died this month? And that's all we talked about ever. You get pretty, con pretty, pretty sad, right? So God says, I know how dark it is here. He's like, I even know more than you know about it. And I'm submitting to you today that he has asked us to shine his lights in this dark world, to be different. Look what Paul says in Philippians 2.14. I like the King James version of this. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. How many things? Do all things without, and other translations say, grumbling, complaining, or murmuring. But now wait a minute, it's a dark world, right? We live in a dark world. And yet, Paul says, do all things, Christian, without grumbling and complaining. Now, how many things do we get to complain about? According to the scripture, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, not according to you, according to the scripture, right? How many things do we get to complain about? None. None. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. Listen, folks, this, is, this really is just basic, basic Christianity, but it's what makes us different. See you, Nick. Good to see you. This is what makes us different in this world. Isn't the world full of grumbling and complaining? Isn't the world, doesn't the world complain about everything? When's the last time you complained about something? Grumbling and complaining. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's what happens here. <laughs> and, if, and if you stop, <laughs> you're going to stick out like a healed thumb. And the scriptures say, let the world see you. Look, verse 15 that you may be blameless, so Rick, do all things without grumbling and complaining, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, daughters of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And I'm submitting to you that it's this not grumbling and complaining that causes us to shine. This will be different than everybody else. It'll be different than all your friends, you may even lose all your friends if you stop complaining. Because a lot of times, that's all people do. And if you don't join in, then you're no longer their friend. But Paul says, don't murmur or complain about anything, ever. <laughs> a, I don't know about you folks, this is a different life. This is like different. This is a dark world, and Jesus says, I want you to shine as light in this world. And today, to do all things without murmuring and complaining, today what we're going to say, uh, put instead of murmuring and complaining, is celebrate and rejoice. Didn't Jesus live this way, without grumbling and complaining? Are there any scriptures where Jesus said, Man, I really can't stand that Herod guy. Any scriptures like that? How about that Pilate? Or that high priest? What a mess he is. Or maybe, you know, Peter's really bugging me this week. He's, 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 he's so, you know, he just, he just keeps making mistakes. He's really bugging me. He just jumps out and does stuff. Or how about that Judas? You know, he's a real piece of work. You don't see any scripture 
where Jesus murmurs, complains, or grumbles. Not all, not ever, not one. He transcended this darkness, and I'm submitting to you that he did it by doing all things without murmuring and complaining. That's how he did it. That's what made him different. Just listen to yourself this week. See, see how often, you know. And I've learned to kind of be quiet a lot. I don't talk as much as I used to because half of it wasn't any good. You're better off just not saying anything. People be like, how come you're not talking? Well, I usually say stupid stuff here. Do all things without murmuring and complaining. And when you do that, you're going to be a light in this world, just like Jesus was. See, a lot of times we think that being like Jesus is some, you know, go sit on top of a mountain or something. No, it's really just real basic stuff. It's really just everyday life. Don't complain. Don't grumble about anything. Why? Because you're supposed to be too busy rejoicing and celebrating. See, if you're at the best party you've ever been to in your life, you're probably not grumbling and complaining. You're celebrating. Amen. So Jesus knows, oh, well, look, Rick's grumbling and complaining. He must have stopped rejoicing. You can't really do both of those things. He transcended the darkness in this world. And that's how he did it. So Jesus talks about his, his joyfulness. Uh, I think Nina even mentioned the scripture today, and we've been talking about this for the last couple months, actually. John 15, 9, he's talking to his disciples on the last night, the night he was betrayed. Excuse me, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. It, it astounds me, Rich and I were talking about this this week, it astounds me that we present and offer salvation to the world without obeying his commands. We just want a decision, you know. But, but there, there is no salvation, there is no remaining in God without obeying his commands. There's, a, there's, there's no offer on the table <laughs> without obeying his commands. It's just not there. Jesus said, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I've told you these things so that you would be filled. Everybody say filled. Filled with joy. Yes, your joy will what? Overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Would you agree with me that Jesus is wrapping all this, uh, connecting all this together about obey my commands, love as I've loved you, and be joyful about it. <laughs> you know, be joyful. Sometimes I don't represent Jesus too well. I don't, I'm not joyful. But he said, if you'll obey my commandments, if you will love one another, if you love your neighbor, you can learn to be joyful. So we've been talking the last few weeks, you know, love as the Father loves, love as Jesus loves us. And some of the things, uh, Nina mentioned some of them today, but some of the things we've been talking about is stop laying up treasures on earth. Do you know that Jesus said that? He's actually the one that said that. I didn't say it. Nina didn't say it. Jesus said it. You, you might think you have an issue with us because we're human beings, and it comes out of a human, <laughs> and it's easy to take issue with other humans. How many know it's easy to find out what's wrong with another human? All you got to do is listen to them for five minutes, and you can say, oh, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And we grumble and complain about everyone or everything. And, and so Jesus said, we didn't say it, Jesus said, stop laying up your treasure on earth. He's got a reason for it. But a smart person just says, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to obey that command. Stop laying up treasures on earth. Instead, lay up your treasure in heaven. 
In another place in Luke, he said, sell what you have and give alms to the poor. I think Rich mentioned this yesterday about the uh, Good Samaritan, but, but love your neighbor means basically get involved, right? Love your neighbor means to get involved. You can't just say, I love my neighbor. You, got, you actually got to get involved. We went down to North Street on Friday. I was helping Nina set up and stuff, and uh, I hadn't been down there in a while. And I saw some regulars, you know, usual faces, people that we've known for years. And uh, Jesus wants you to see people. It's easy to just put them out of your mind. He wants you to see them. You know why? Because his compassion is in you. If you're, if you're a believer in Jesus, his compassion is in you. You put yourself in a place. Isn't that what he did all day long? He just put himself in a place where his compassion would come out. And I'm, and I'm seeing these people, and I'm, I'm, I'm connecting with them, and, you, and guess what? I felt ashamed. I literally felt ashamed. I was ashamed that I couldn't do more for them. That's the love of God in you. Now, I know my limitations. I have limitations. <laughs> I was telling the prisoners on, on Tuesday, God could give me a million dollars tomorrow. You think a million dollars is hard for God? That's not hard for God. We could buy 10 houses. That's what I do. He knows what I do with it. So he could give me that money. But I don't have it. I can't see it. Can't use it yet. So I'm not frustrated about that. I just serve him. But you know what my job is? You know, my part is? I'm a branch. I'm to bear fruit. I'm to love people with whatever it is I have. Not sit and complain about what I don't have. I'm to love with what I do have. That's what, that's what love our neighbor is. They said, Jesus, who's my neighbor? You know, what should I do? And the, the guy answered and he said, love God, love your neighbor. And then he said, but who's my neighbor? And of course, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. And he basically was saying, get involved. You got to touch base. You got to connect because my heart's in you. My love is in you. My compassion's in you. You got to go to them. Use what you have for them. And I like that he, he paid for shelter because we're, we're you know, focused on shelter right now. And this good Samaritan paid for shelter for this guy. <laughs> and he said, he said, if you need more, I'll, I'll give you more. I'm in the business of sharing what I have with people. That's what I do. <laughs> you know, and that's how Jesus answered the guy. The original question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then the second question was, okay, if I have to love my neighbor, who's my neighbor? And I'm submitting to you that Jesus is connecting all this together. He's connecting love, keep his commandments, obey him, do what he says, and your joy will be full. If you get it right, you will overflow in joy. If you get it right. Now, if you just keep mumber, murmuring and complaining about everything and what you don't have and what, what's missing and what's not right and what's wrong in this dark world and, and what, you know, all the ministers can do this too. We're, we, sometimes we're the worst. And we just begin, listen, we just begin to rejoice and celebrate. That's how we shine as lights in this world, that our joy is filled, full, overflowing. Well, he goes on to say, you know, this was the night he was going to be betrayed, so he's going to bring that up. Oh, little man. John 16, 22. So you have sorrow now, because he's talking about he was going to be taken from them. But I will see you again, and then, listen, then you will rejoice, and no man or no one can rob you of that joy. In verse 24, he says, ask using my name, and you'll receive, and you'll have abundant joy. That's what we do. We just ask God for stuff. I got tired of 
asking God for stuff for me. So I just ask God for stuff for people. I'd like to help that person. I'd like to help this person. I'd like to house these people. I'd like to feed this person. I'd like to shelter this person. I'd like to visit those guys in prison. I had to knock on that door for months. It was locked out, you know, with COVID. They weren't letting anybody in. I just kept knocking, knocking, knocking. Now we can go in and do anything we want in there. <laughs> we just have God's favor. So that you will have abundant joy. And this joy, nobody can take it from you. Life can't take it from you. This dark world can't take it from you. If you're a believer, listen, if you're a believer, you celebrate and rejoice in this world. That's what believers do. Now, I agree, you haven't ever seen a whole lot of believers in your life, but that's what they do if you ever see a real one. Most of us are whining and grumbling and complaining about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but Jesus has lived this way, folks. He said, you've seen my joy. This is how I operate. I want you to have that same joy. And the father in the prodigal son story, which we've been talking about in and out for the last few months, he lived this way too. He loved. And he's where I got this idea from. He celebrated and rejoiced. That's what love will do to you, folks. And we've read this story, and, and you can read the whole thing. It's a great story. Just keep reading it over and over. There's so much in there. But Luke 15, 31, where uh, the older brother came in, and he was upset and, and uh, uh, angry and about the unfairness of life. And his, his uh, brother had wasted all his father's goods. And he was really upset and angry, the Bible says. And his father said to him, here's how his father responded to him. Look, dear son. You have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to, everybody say had to. had to. We had to celebrate on this happy day. We have to celebrate. That word celebrate is where I got these last few weeks from, uh, sermons from, is euphrano. We get our word euphoria. We have to be euphoric. We have to, he said. We have to be euphoric. If you're going to represent Jesus, you have to be euphoric about it. Amen. Do you know what a group of this size could do if we got euphoric about Jesus? Not about the world and all its little temporary things that it gives us, but about Jesus, about obeying Jesus, euphoric about Jesus, <laughs> you know, about keeping his commandments. <laughs> the, that word means feeling intense excitement, euphoria, great happiness and well-being. So let me ask you, do you think the older brother lived this way? Did he live euphoric? Yet he was in his father's house, right? He, he did all that he was supposed to do. He lived a good life. He wasn't wasteful like his lazy brother. He, he, he served God. He kept all the words and the commandments of his father and, and he... he did everything right, except he wouldn't celebrate. Isn't that funny? We'll do almost anything. We'll do almost anything for God. Except rejoice right now. <laughs> we'll do anything except rejoice. <laughs> celebrate. And the father says, no, he's a son. You must celebrate. You must. But he couldn't. The Bible says he was angry. He was grumbling and complaining. He couldn't celebrate. He couldn't rejoice. And I'm saying it's crucial. He couldn't love. <laughs> no love as the Father. You know, no laying up treasure in heaven. No ring and robe and sandals and calf and and celebrating and rejoicing. He had none of that. It wasn't in his life. It wasn't part of his life. And the father said, you must celebrate. You must. Now listen. There's something we don't understand. 
If we're not loving as this Father, if we're not loving as Jesus loved us, if we're not keeping his commandments, if we seem to be having a little struggle with laying up treasures in heaven, with selling and giving alms, with getting involved, with being the Good Samaritan, with going out of our way, with getting us off our mind for just a little bit and doing something for somebody. If we seem to be having trouble doing that, I'm not talking about what you want to do. I'm talking about what you actually do. And if we seem to be having trouble doing it, listen, there's something you don't understand. There was something this older brother didn't understand. And it's exactly what the father told him. Son, you missed the point of being with me. You don't understand something. You know what that way is? Everything God has is yours. You don't understand that. If you ever do understand that, you can't help yourself. You're going to celebrate and rejoice. That's a pretty big deal. I don't know. See, we, we can't even, the words don't, doesn't communicate what it is. But isn't that what he told the son? Look, dear son, you've always stayed by me. And here's what you don't understand. This is why you don't celebrate. This is why you can't. He couldn't celebrate. He couldn't love his brother. He was so consumed with, with anger and bitterness and so consumed with complaining and grumbling and, and this dark world that he lived in. The unfairness and hardness of the life he had. He was so consumed with it. And the father says, here's what you don't understand. Everything I have is yours. Man, if you ever get that, no one can stop you. Isn't that what Jesus said? No, no man can take that joy. No one can stop you. If you ever, if you ever get this part, <laughs> then my work's done. It's finished. It's all done. Everything I have is yours. Nobody can ever change that. Time to celebrate. And if we ever get it, I can't help myself from celebrating. I drive to church, and I know what's going to happen here in the mornings. And I just drive to church celebrating. Thank you, Jesus. I don't wait to see if anybody shows up. It wouldn't surprise me if no one showed up. That wouldn't surprise me. I would just celebrate. Because nothing has changed. Everything God has is mine. Nothing ever can change that. If I ever think right, I'll rejoice about that. But isn't that funny that we don't choose to rejoice about that? Isn't that a crazy choice that we make? Jesus said it's actually, it's insanity <laughs> to choose this world over what he offers. <laughs> it's insanity. <laughs> Everything he has, he's given us. Everything. And I tell you, when we don't believe it, man, this world is a dark place. Jesus lived this way. He lived the way he's telling this story he lived this way. Look what he said also in John 16, 15, right in that same uh, discourse with his disciples that night. All that belongs to the Father is mine. Other translations say all things are everything. Would you agree with me that Jesus lives this way? Amen. Everything the Father has is mine. That's why I'm so joyful. <laughs> it's all been given to me. Now, could you see it at any given time? Before he needed... 5,000 lunches for the men and plus women and children, so let's say 15,000 lunches. Before he needed 15,000 lunches, could he see that everything had been given to him? Couldn't see it. What could he see? Five loaves, two fish, and everything God has is mine. That's what he, that's what he could see. And it seemed to work pretty well. See that? He wasn't storing up 15,000 lunches because he was going to have a big deal the next day. He just lived the way he's teaching us to live. Just celebrate. Rejoice. Why? Everything I, everything I have is yours. If you'll ever start acting like this is true, if you'll ever start acting 
like everything God has is yours? Oh, you'll obey Jesus. You'll, you'll lay up treasures in heaven. You'll sell and give alms. You'll, you'll be the good Samaritan. You'll get involved. Why not? Everything God has is mine. Why wouldn't I live like that? Jesus lived this way. Paul did too. He understood the same thing. Look, we're almost done. Stay with me. Romans 8.32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us what? Would you agree? Paul seemed to agree with Jesus, right? He gave us all things. Peter agrees also. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, if you trust him, if you really do trust him, you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. I'm telling you, folks, you know what your number one job is to do this week? Rejoice. Stop. You might have to stop talking for a little while. But stop talking and rejoice. Celebrate. And when your crazy mind says, what are you talking about? What are you celebrating? Why are you? Don't you see how crazy life is? How dark this world is? How messed up your life is? Your body, uh, your relationships, whatever it is. Don't you see how messed up? And you say, yeah, yeah, I can see all of that. But everything God has is mine. Everything God has is mine. Nothing will ever change that for the rest of eternity. So let me just ask you this. Is it true? That's, this is kind of where we've got to come to. Is it true? We've got, we got to decide for our lives. Is it true? Is it actually mine? Is everything mine? Are, they, are these scriptures true? Is it true? It may be, it may be harder to answer for ourselves because we don't see it and we're so used to believing only what we see. But we can see the story of the older brother was it true for the older brother? Did he have everything? He did. In this story, he had everything. But it didn't help him. Could he rejoice? No. He couldn't rejoice. He couldn't celebrate. He's too busy. Too busy murmuring and complaining. All right, so let's learn. Let me, real quick. It's usually these few examples and then we'll close with this. Adam and Eve. Here you go, Adam, Eve, everything I have is yours. The work's done, it's finished, it's all yours. Let's celebrate and rejoice. And what did Adam and Eve say? Hmm. No, I want something else. Isn't that right? Everything I have is yours, I want something else. This is humans we're talking about. Jesus says, Everything I have is yours. I've given you everything I have. I give you my whole life. I gave it to you. And everything I have is yours. And we say, I want something else. I want something more. I'm not celebrating right now. I refuse to celebrate right now. And we can learn from their mistakes. How about Israel? They're like the champion. 40 years, right? 40 years. God says, okay, I'm going to deliver you. I'm, uh, the, the Passover uh, lamb is going to spare you. You put the blood on the doorpost. The death angel passes over. Uh, e Egypt lets you go. You're going to pass through the Red Sea. There's a pillar of fire for, at night so you can stay warm and a cloud during the day so you can stay cool. And I'll provide your every need. And not only that, this is a real short, maybe a couple week journey to the promised land. All the work's been done. Everything's been taken care of. It's all good. It's finished. Everything's great. Time to celebrate and rejoice. And what do they do? No. Nope. I'm not going to. I'm going to grumble and I'm going to complain. And they did for 40 years. And God just let them. That's what I do as a minister. I just let you. Just grumble, complain. People do all the time. I just let them. Forty years, whine, murmur, complain, and you'll die that way.
And God just lets you. <laughs> and all that time, they could have been celebrating, right? And rejoicing. But just a short journey to the promised land. Older brother, same way. Had everything. Son, we must celebrate. No. I refuse. Not going to. Too much going on. Just can't do it. And here's, here's the trickiest one. Christian, 2021. As a Christian, I grumble and complain. I don't celebrate and rejoice too much. I mean, even at church, it's like pulling teeth. I don't really celebrate. I don't lay up my treasures in heaven. I don't use my money and possessions to care for the poor. I don't sell things and give alms. I don't feed the hungry. I don't shelter the homeless. I don't visit the sick and the prisoner. I don't do any of these. I don't care for the widow and the orphan. I don't do any of it. I don't help the man in the ditch. That's somebody else's thing. I don't do it. But what I do do is I still lay up treasure for me and for myself. I do all this. Now, this is Christian 2021. And Jesus, I believe in Jesus. I don't do any of that, but I believe in Jesus. This is the modern day Christian. Oh, I believe in Jesus. But I don't do it. I don't do anything he tells me to do. I don't do it. I just say no. <laughs> just like Adam and Eve, no. Just like Israel, no. I'm not going to do it. Just like the older brother, we must celebrate, no. And we just don't do it. But we say we believe. This is, this is very tricky. Very tricky. All right. Close with this. I think there's a closing here somewhere. Luke 15, 28. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. And as far as the story goes, he never did go in. He would not stop grumbling and complaining. He would not love as his father. He would not celebrate and rejoice and his father came out and even after his father begged him he wouldn't change his father begged him I'm, I'm, I believe this I believe God is begging us <laughs> I mean I might sound like I'm begging but I believe God is begging us he's begging me Rick will you please love people will you please obey me will you just celebrate and rejoice Everything I have is yours. Amen. 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 All right. Church finally ended today. Let's thank uh, uh, Facebook for joining us. Praise the Lord.